we're going to talk about Gucci Fall Winter 24 menswear. Of course, this is Sabato Desano's second official collection as creative director of Gucci. It's also his first menswear collection at Gucci. And this is a role that, as most of you know, he's had since last year. Um, before becoming creative director at Gucci, he had design roles at Prada, Dolce & Gabbana, and more recently, before he went to Gucci, he was actually director of men's and women's collections at Valentino. So clearly someone that's worked in the industry for, you know, a long time, someone that is a seasoned designer. So this season, the collection was really a sister collection to the women's wear collection. This is nothing new. This is something that many brands do. I mean, we talk about Prada doing this every single season, that the men's wear mirrors the women's wear every single season. So nothing new there. Um, and actually, what I find really interesting, if you read um, the Vogue review, he had some some choice words for people that were critiquing um, his debut collection. Um, so to read what he said, he said, I read some critics in September who said, oh, he just did a commercial collection for the brand, blah, blah, blah. This is bullshit. I don't care about an Instagram moment. And so what he did with this collection, apart from just Lots it being normal to, apart from it just being normal for your collection to, you know, be mirrored between menswear and women's wear, he actually specifically doubled down on this collection mirroring the women's wear. So in his words, it gives us more time to take it in and it gives the critics more time to reevaluate kind of our thoughts on the initial collection, which I thought was like kind of a very interesting perspective on things i watched the show and i was actually i was intrigued to see what it was like and then i was seeing the mood and then i was seeing the themes and i was quite like um i was quite pleased i guess like that's that's a good word to you that i was quite pleased with what i was seeing and i was looking at the construction and the detailing that like obviously you can't see them all um straight away until you get like the images that give you all of the close-ups but i could just tell that the show was very well detailed in terms of like the design because there's not necessarily a focus on you know grand design in terms of you know the maximalism um, route, um that michele went through so now it's going into like more nuanced level design and yeah that's that was my initial thoughts what about you yeah, I think um, I'm going to obviously expand on why I think this, but I definitely prefer this to the Women's Wear collection, like, a lot. Um, and there's many reasons for that. Even though it's a sister collection, actually a lot of it is extremely different. Um, just some of the fabrics were the same. And, like, even the first look in this show was very similar to the first look in the Women's Wear show. Damn near, like, almost identical with, without, like, certain pieces. Um, so even though they're kind of similar, I feel like the men's wear um, was more, but kind of just to start with from the top, on my opinion, I think him saying that, you know, he doesn't care about the Instagram moment and he's not just designing a commercial collection. I understand where some of that frustration could potentially come from, because obviously his Gucci does focus on craft. And when you go to the showroom, you actually see that a lot of craft has gone into making the clothes and it's actually made really, really well. So that is definitely something that is true in a sense where if you're not up close to the clothes, it's very hard for you to appreciate um, clothes that don't have a way of catching you through social media, through video mm -hmm. as a medium, through images on Instagram, that sort of stuff. So I understand that. But I think in context of critics saying that he designed a commercial collection, I think these things are all about context. And the problem I have with a lot of the ways that people critique runway shows, especially when it's at a big luxury house, is that people almost remove the art out of the context of the fact that this brand actually exists in the space of a massive conglomerate. And these brands are billion dollar brands with their end goal being making billions. And so when you think about that, it was it's not um, new news that Kering had issues with Gucci. This is why they went in a different direction from Alessandro Michele. There's so many reports on the Financial Times, on Forbes, across BOF, where they said that the share prices for Gucci were going down, 
the performance of Gucci was in question. So when you have all of that context together and then there is such a stark move to minimalism by Gucci, you can then say, okay, I can see how this is more commercial because this is more in line with kind of what Gucci wants to do from a financial perspective. That's why they went away from Alessandro. So it's not like these things just come out of the sky. It's not like these things just come from, you know, nowhere. And when you look at the Women's Wear show, we do see a lot of things that are stripped to their bare bones. We we're looking at grey hoodies with Gucci embossed in them, white sleeveless vests. Um, some of the dresses, even the bus didn't really fit the best. So I just don't think it's like, as much as I definitely think he does focus on the craft, and I kind of love that about his Gucci, and I don't think there is a Gucci look. It kind of reminds me of when Adi Saman went to Celine, and, you know, people are saying that, oh, this is not Celine anymore. And it's like, okay, Phoebe Philo does not own the look of Celine. There were designers before her, and there will be designers after her. So I don't think the brand should be necessarily associated with one specific silhouette or look or colour or aesthetic. Um, but that being said, I just think it's not far-fetched for critics to look at the show and be like, okay, this is super commercial for to hit financial targets, if that makes sense. Um, so that's why I wanted to say along the financial side. So what do you have to say about that? Yeah, so I've been watching, like, I watched the show in context, right? So my first initial thoughts was quite dark, right? It was like, you know, nice. But then my brain started turning. I was just like, okay, so it's a show. We're in like financial straits. Um, there's a recession looming or people, um, well, at least no one's really admitting there's a recession. So um, people that are, have savvy understand that, you know, they got to be tied to with money, right? I was also reading reports that, you know, secondary markets are going up in terms of um, people buying pre-loved goods as well as the price of um, Gucci, LV, um, Hermes and Chanel bags are, go are like going down in terms of people buying them when it comes to resale goods. So then now we're looking at the focus on, okay, so this is a new collection in the context of financial straits and a new direction with the creative director. And then I was, I was just thinking to myself, I feel like there's something going on here. And then there's obviously the LVMH and Karen battle, right? Which is what you were um, alluding to earlier. And I wanted to like kind of dig down in that point and buttress it and say, with that, because it wasn't just that Gucci was doing bad, because they were quite profitable, right? They are the most profitable um, house at Corinne. Yeah, and the it context was, that... was the, the growth was slowing down. Yes. That's the context yeah. of Gucci doing bad, yeah. Yeah, and... It there was also that LV, as in like Louis Vuitton, was capturing more market share, especially in the emerging market at our China, right? So that was a fault. And then now we're heading, we were heading into a stealth wealth era, anyways, um, thanks to Bottega and um, Loewe, and you know just what happens when we go into a recession. And then I saw the way that. Um, Loewe and Louis Vuitton were splintering and then I saw the way that Gucci and um, Bottega were merging almost and then I was like quick mm. in a second when it comes down to like just design direction I saw there was a stark difference when it comes to uh, LVMH's brands and there was actually a marriage when it came to Corinne brands and I was quite confused in that, considering that when it comes to business, right, and as you said, the point of the business is to make billions. Mm. And can, and there's also another point to that, which is you need to be able to differentiate yourself within the market. So why are two brands from the same parent company kind of focusing within the same area and technically right. fighting for market share for the same mm. type of consumer and that was really quite odd to me and i'm still like um digging down and like you know putting my feet in there because i get the sensation and understanding that 
this may not be the most positive thing for um, Kerry in the long run. And then I was li- reading what Sarno, um, Sarno said, and I was like, he's really into this. Like He's very, very much into this. And he doesn't like the direction that everybody else is going in. And he prefers exactly what we, what we see on here. So he's not trying to change anytime soon. Mm-hmm. So it's not that the writing's on the wall. However, there's a fundamental, like, philosophy that Karen is following right now that mm. is so different than whatever LV, LVMH is doing, like LV and uh, Loewe is doing. So, yeah, like, that was, like, my main thing. And it was, I guess the main critique would be that I don't un- I don't understand the reason that um Bottega and Gucci would be fine for the same market. Yeah. No, no, that's an interesting point. And I think even down to like um cuz I sat down with myself and I was thinking why do I prefer this so much more than the women's wear collection? Um not that my arbitrary opinion on what I prefer is actually it's not fact, it's just an opinion. Um but I kind of came to the conclusion after sitting with it for so long that I think that this Ancora series, which is obviously the overlying arc with the women's wear and the men's wear collection, I think the silhouettes just work better on men than they do women. Um, And I think from the two collections I'm seeing, I just think that Sabato Desano is a way better men's wear designer um, than he is a women's wear designer. And it really just kind of reminded me of You know when women say there's like a woman's touch that comes with a woman designing women's wear? Like this is the kind of point that people bring up when they talk about the likes of Phoebe Philo, they talk about Jill Sander being so good at making women's wear that's minimal, but it just looks so luscious and luxurious and flattering on women. And that kind of, a lot of that has to do with like a woman's touch on women's wear. And I don't necessarily believe that this is always true, but there's definitely some truth to it because I mean, there are men that have definitely designed amazing women's wear like Yves Saint Laurent and then there are women like Martine Rose that design good men's wear. So it's not like set in stone. Um, but that was kind of something that um, came to my mind. And I think that there's a big difference between, because when we say minimalism, it's such a broad and to these days, almost like a vague term. I think there's a difference between kind of like when I say something's commercial, it just means that it could be any other brand, at least to me when I say something's commercial. So the last collection, when I said, oh, it looks really commercial, it could literally be any brand. And there's a difference between that and minimal. Because when I think of like brands that are minimal, like when we say minimalism, when we think of Helmut Lang, we think of Jill Sander, we actually think of like a very specific cut. If you think of designers like Yoji Yamamoto, Helmut Lang, Rick Owens, Armani, these are all designers that don't put loads of prints and patterns and loads of like their clothing is not fussy but when you see their work no one needs to tell you that oh that's a rick owens jacket no one needs to tell you that's a, those are helmet lang jeans no one needs to tell you that's a martin rose jacket no one needs to tell you that's an armani suit because their shape is so refined and their silhouette is so distinctive and their tailoring is so distinctive that it's to the point that the silhouette is recognizable as its own logo if that makes sense and that is just not what you get in Sabato de Sano's first um, Gucci collection. So that's why people are more inclined to say, oh, this is really commercial because it's in line with just a lot of like very generic silhouettes that we see um, when it comes to tailoring with women's wear. Now, that was the case with the women's wear show. With the men's wear show, I don't think that's the case. I think we're definitely seeing more of like a design language. We're seeing more of a tailoring language. We're seeing certain themes that I think that Sabato is going to continue moving forward with Gucci. Um, And I think everyone has their own way of tailoring things. I mean, like even to go back to Armani, the people that are subscribed to Patreon know this because the last episode, we literally talked about the history of Armani. But Armani is literally seen as someone that modernized tailoring because he's someone that used less muted color. Sorry, he used... um, different colors to what we associate with tailoring, especially British tailoring, like the navies, the charcoals, the blacks. He started using colors like beige 
and olive and then he made the fabrics a bit more unstructured because in England because it's cold we use tweed and all these thick fabrics and he was using things you know like wool jersey and linen and all that stuff that's why people call Armani the father of the unstructured suit so just because something is minimal does not make it bad and does not make it not distinctive but I think with the first Gucci show what the issue with it is it wasn't distinctive the silhouette was in line with anything else that you see there's nothing really you don't look at it and think okay this is a new design language in through shape but that's kind of what I'm getting with the menswear collection um and I think for me that's where the stark difference is between the women's wear collection and the men's wear collection of course there were tiny little details like the asymmetric ties that were kind of like used as like these necklace accessories in the last show they had um platform horse bit loafers in this collection instead they have creeper loafers horse bit loafers which is also like a different touch and there were different things that were different like in this show they have these really interesting gloves that end they don't even go all the way to your wrist i really like those those are kind of interesting and they look kind of different to just the normal gloves that everyone designs um so yeah yeah very very interesting but i think that is the main reason why i really really prefer this collection over the Wombs are a collection, but yeah, I've I've gone on for long enough. What do you think, Dummy? I don't, I don't necessarily have a preference between this one and the Wombs are strong. To be honest, I'm 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 concerning myself with the overall direction just as of now. Like I wanted to collect um, more context within what he's doing, and I do agree with you that he does have a hand or an eye for menswear more than he would necessarily have for women's wear. And the women's wear, especially when it first happened, like the top of last year, I was, I wasn't a major fan of it. I wasn't a major fan of the look, like there was a, a numerous things, right? Uh, that I wasn't a major fan of. However, when now I'm seeing them in different stages, it's now telling more of a story in terms of what he values especially what he values in menswear. And one thing that I can say, though, is that as much as he has this um, aesthetic or even design direction, right? I, I don't really like using the word aesthetic anymore, but just as design direction that has the values of, you know, tailoring and the values of silhouette and also being able to use patterns even though it's like scarcely or it's sparse in areas, he's also be like, he's not shying away from it, right? So he's got a full mm -hmm. monogram suit and all of these other things. So he will use it. It's just that the way he's using it, it allows for more breathing room for a different type of clientele. And it's involving mm. more people, right? And then also, because I wanted to like really dig down into the point I made earlier, I actually went side by side on the Bottega and the Gucci shows and really just compared and contrasted some of the silhouettes, especially with the jackets, right? And he has a very distinctive look when it comes to him building a jacket and creating something that he values in that um, values in mm -hmm. that light for menswear. So yeah. what I'm noticing, and to be honest, like what I see here and what I enjoyed watching the most from the show is just the jackets and the detailing like you go on the website as well and you can see like just the level of detail that he applied like even with the puffers and you know the um the embellishments on them and the um the monogram suit those particular type of things are they're just they have a level of care and value especially when it comes to designing for men that right. I've, I'm quite endeared to because there is, there's been a certain theme recently in fashion where it's like, um, you can just put anything on anybody and something. Oh my God. We, we need different. to talk about that. We need to talk about that. <laughs> so, yeah. so th the thing about that is that even though any like anyone can wear a suit or anyone can wear a blazer um and this is something that i've thought about a lot because i in my last patreon episode i was talking about armani and like in the process of doing that i was yeah. like reading up on a lot of his work and stuff 
And like, just to use Armani as like an example, one of the reasons why Armani became popular was because he saw a gap in the market. He realized that there's like the type of man that has his tailor and will go to the tailor and has that symbiotic relationship with the tailor. Um, and so he doesn't really need help because he has his tailor. He's always going to have bespoke, you know, suits that fit him properly. But then there was a massive gap between that guy and then what you see off the rack, which was horrible in his words. Like everything was just so ill-fitting. So he was like, why don't I try to create a silhouette that works really well on most men and is a lot better than the options that are already out there, right? Yeah. Um, and that's why so many people started buying his clothes because it was like, you didn't have to think about it. It just kind of just fit really, really nicely. And the problem is when you take those kind of considerations out of it and just say, yeah, anyone can wear anything or whatever. You need to remember that men on average have broader shoulders. This is just like biology. Um, so if you're gonna design a more menswear leaning, let's say blazer, obviously the shoulders are going to be broader than you would if it was a blazer for women, right? On average. Um, and even though, yes, you can design like a blazer that, you know, doesn't necessarily have to go through those considerations and that would be considered more avant-garde than the normal process of just making a suit that like fits perfectly on your body, like a glove. Um, that being said, these considerations are things that we have to mention. I think now we've fallen into the realm of fashion where it's like, these things don't mean anything. It's just like anyone wear anything. And that's where like fit starts to become an issue. Mm. And I've noticed that, especially when it comes to younger clientele or just consumers in general that that's where oversized comes into play and i do have this like adage which is oversized and too big are different things so there is an oversized for someone who is a small and then there is an oversized for someone who's a large someone who's wearing um a small <laughs> that puts on a large the sleeves are just too long <laughs> what happens when you buy um when you are making oversized is that there are certain considerations that are made for the armhole and the taper of the arm mm -hmm. and then that's what makes it oversized as well as like obviously the chest measurements and so on and so forth right but 100%. when you're buying a large you are buying something that is ill-fitting and it can look clunky depending on how you style it and it's not just anything that you can put on that isn't made for you like obviously you see some celebrities wear um oversized fits but these celebrities have the resources and the power to mm -hmm. make it look great because they're on a red carpet and there's going to be a thousand pictures of them as soon as they jump out of the car so there are different things that we have to think about when we are actually building this um sentiment so for um when it comes to suits, like, uh, as you know, like I'm working in suiting now and I'm working with a particular clientele and just seeing that um, there is a level of disdain to mm. caring about, oh, oh, for people caring about, or the general fashion audience, uh, funnily enough, right? People caring about, oh, mm. this is um, menswear. Now, when you go into mm -hmm. a, a, like, just a tailor, um, an atelier, or like um, a suiting shop, you know that the clientele somewhat cares about a suit. What, the, right. what they're apprehensive about is that them not knowing what they can wear. And then that's mm -hmm. where the consultation comes into play and actually delving in that styling journey. So it's not, so when you're working, or at least when I'm doing my work, it's not just, um, some sort of um i can sell any old person any old suit now it's like there are certain considerations that are taken into play and these are and these suits are bought for work celebrations and you know important occasions and mm -hmm. these people want to look their best and what i know is that as much as there's a gap between the knowledge there's the same understanding that yo I care about looking good in this thing, not that I can just fling anything on. And that is kind of what happens in, in quotes, high fashion, right? And for me personally, 
I don't take that lightly. And the conversation of what is menswear and what is masculinity has been like quite pervasive over the years. And really I'm try- I'm seeing more of men kind of billing in the opposite direction where it's like, okay, more men like workwear. And then that mm-hmm. workwear trend kind of evolved into men being able to have fitted things that are that are like tailored to their specifications. So like when people wear Carhartt, they're wearing something that's direct and cut in a certain particular type of way, as well as all the other um like all terrain gears, like Arcteryx and so and those and things of that nature. So yeah, like for me personally, I'm seeing a trend now. Like it's it's a smaller trend, but a trend now of men caring about just sartorial excellence, which is um, mm-hmm. appreciated by me. Yeah, I mean, there is definitely a comeback in terms of that. Um, also, something about this collection that I really enjoyed was it almost felt like um, Sabato was posing similar questions to the ones that Alessandro Michele posed with his first two collections at Gucci. And it's kind of like this idea of uh, what is masculinity? What is considered masculine? I mean, a lot of the collection, a lot of the pieces in this collection were like bedazzled. And we had these like tote bag sized Jackie bags, but they still look like women's bags, which was interesting because they're the kind of bags that it, the random person on the street, if you wear them, they'll think you're wearing a woman's bag, which is not normally typical. I think Fendi is one of the other brands that does kind of women's wear looking bags for men. Um, which I do find kind of interesting because it challenges people's notions of, um, at the end of the day, it's just a bag. Um, But for some reason, people see or associate those things with like feminine connotations, which I find really hilarious. There was like this thread that I was reading of just like people going mad that um, Gucci is feminizing clothing and I was just dying reading it. Um, It's like all this stuff, stop the constant attempts of feminizing men there will come a day when you need real men who were, <laughs> were taught what are apparently the old ways, who know how to do more than make emails and expensive coffee. <laughs> that is funny. That is actually funny. It's quite crazy you know, how offended people get over, like, bags. It's like, it's just a bag. Someone was getting offended over a bag. You just wear it over your shoulder, and if you need to put things in it, you put it in there. And when you need them, you open a bag and you take them out. There's nothing feminine about that. Yeah. Plus, we have pockets. Like, if you're in a suit, you have, like, six pockets. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, this... Yeah, no. So, I, I thought that like was really it. interesting, though. Because if you think of, like, Alessandro's um, first two collections, it was very androgynous. And it was, like, yeah. very, um, like, the pussy bow blouses and, like, pieces like that. And like even the models, like you couldn't really tell. Also, um, yeah, yeah, it's all it's all really interesting. Like what I learned about Sarno is that he enjoys partying. Mm. He enjoys partying. Like um, there's this story in the article where it's like he was like he was in the offices, right, and like nobody came mm. to see him, and he didn't like that, so he like decided to throw a party. And then he was the most drunk mm. and was dancing the most in the party, right? And, you know, he also speaks about, you know, being in the gay scene and, like, going from um, where he was, I believe was in Rome, to, like, you know, the hyped-up gay scene um, elsewhere and just how much that drastically changed his life, like, especially, like, being with Pier Paolo and, you know, Pier Paolo giving him the blessings so, on, like, all of, the, all of the good stuff, right? Mm. Um what I understand is that um, it's not that um, there are questions about what is masculinity, is that masculinity is being more inclusive to other people that are men, right? Mm. And just because you're wearing a suit, that is not like a, you know, that's not a mark saying that you're more masculine than a guy that's wearing a t-shirt or a hoodie, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing where it's like, just because you're wearing a vest doesn't mean that you're more masculine than someone uh say so all of these things and like where he's got the like um the singlet or the vest right with the necktie and everything like that that's a throwback to even the bohemians and the way that they like to dress um back in the 90s and the late 80s right 
So it in my eyes, it seemed like a nod to Mikello, but at the same time, what I see now with um, the girls that are dressing like that and some of the guys as well is that mm-hmm. that is a nod to the party scene. That is what pe- that's what people wear. Like when you go outside, that's what you see people wearing the party scene, and it's quite cool to be honest. Like so, it's like that um, that inclusivity of what men like what men will actually wear and what men will actually dress like because. I didn't, I, in the beginning, I never saw the need to have the questions. I saw the need to be more inclusive of what other men, uh, or should I say, what men as a consensus decided what was masculine. And I thought that was right. the more, more important question or the more um, important way to frame this conversation. No, no, I totally agree. And I think it's kind of crazy that we kind of still have to have these conversations about masculinity. And, like, people tying masculinity to very, 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 very specific things. Um, I find it really odd that we kind of still have to have that conversation um, down to, like, because I don't even see, even if I was to try and think, like, people that had an issue with this collection in terms of it feminizing men, crazy. But even if I was to try and think how they think, there's nothing when I look at this collection that I'm like, okay, that looks feminine to me anyway. Mm. Um, so I don't really, I don't even know where it comes from. And the shape of a bag is, is not like that's not femininity at all. Yeah, like, I know. <laughs> that's that's the other thing. That's like <laughs> like the most simple one is that the shape of the bag does not make you feminine. I'll be wrong. It's a I big think. Jackie bag. I mean. It is mad interesting, though. I mean, I get comments every day where I might say something about fashion and then people have found, like, my channel for the first time and they're like, gay men like you will not dictate how fashion works. And it's like, bro, so because I'm talking about fashion, you automatically pigeonholed me into a certain sexuality. But it's like, that's how I think backwards the conversation is or how behind the conversation is. Mm. Um in like wider society when it comes to masculinity, it is quite crazy. No, for sure. Like, this, the conversation is that it hasn't evolved much. And I guess like, cause we're almost creeping on 10 years on mm. like, since like wanted to talk about fashion. Like, I don't know about you, but like 2016, <laughs> 2017, <laughs> like well, I'm knocking on the corner, bro. <laughs> like, so it's like, um, yeah, that's what that's a wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, I find it like intriguing that there are people that are laggards, is the way that I'm gonna pose it, right? They're, they're the laggards in terms of, oh, you haven't yet caught up to where the conversation actually is. Because, whereas, um, what we're seeing now is more inclusivity and in what uh, men actually are, so like people, um, trying i guess just trying to be less homophobic i'm not saying i'm not going to say that people are less homophobic but trying mm. like appearing to be right maybe some people are doing better than others but um there's that and it's now more of a it's, it's there's more of a field of thought where it's like you know there are people who are come from all different walks of life that are sharing in the conversation in terms of what would men like to dress like so like like, in the same singular day you can see you know the looks people are wearing in china then you can see the looks people are wearing in japan then you can see the looks that people are wearing in bosnia you can see the and all all over the world south america like you know south africa nigeria like there's brazil everything so you get to see that Mm -hmm. all in the space of one day so it kind of in a sense creates certain consensuses right and mm. how men like to dress and like even the way that our influences lie right so i saw an uptick of people of men wanted to wear more ties when the oppenheimer film came out because if you watch oppenheimer those suits were immaculate mm. these men were ma- wearing the most tasteful suit that i have seen in a movie in a quite some time and there's a tv show coming out called gentlemen which is probably going to have the same effect so I'm quite intrigued into how that stuff is going to evolve and, and so on and so forth, right? But the way that the conversation is, is that's where we are. 
but then we have the laggards where it's like, oh, you know, you're going to assume someone's sexuality or gender, like all of these other things because, you know, they're talking about fashion or, you know, they like this or they like that and and then, yeah, and they're supporting their friends or whatever it is, right? Like there's there's been many times where <laughs> I've supported my friends that are just look differently than everyone else and then they're, and people are like, oh, wait, are you? You know, I thought you were, and it's like, don't worry about it, man. It's cool. Like, <laughs> I get it all the time. Like, I can't even... Yeah, it's cool, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what do you think about Gucci pushing um, a specific color of red? It seems like I kind of call it the Daniel Lee effect, where ever since Bottega Green became a hit, everyone is trying to have their color. Like, Valentina have kind of almost successfully gotten, like, that pink shade as, like, their signature colour. Um, Daniel Lee at Burberry right now is trying to give us Burberry blue. I'm not sure if that has stuck yet. And then Gucci are giving us a certain sort of, like, reddish colour. Um, do you think these things are going to stick? Um, can we can we get up the red, um, the red, please, quick? Oh, yeah, of um, course. This particular red, no. Um, um, and I'll tell you why. Um, this shade of red, like, or this is shade. It, uh, burgundy, or is it that red? Yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of it's like wine. in between burgundy and, yeah, yeah, yeah it's like wine-ish. Yeah, so this particular red is so in season right now, it's not even funny. In fact, mm. I actually... Uh, have a vintage jacket. I don't know if anyone can see it. Right, there we go. And I, it's it's looking more red here than it does. Like I mean, under ox blood. Like, so that's a yes. yeah. I like that ox blood. So, so that red is in season. So maybe we'll see it more. However, mm. you can't necessarily own something when it's in season. The reason why Bottega Green was so powerful is because nobody was wearing that green during that time people are wearing wine burgundy um ferrari red and oxblood all in the same season right so there's so many different types of red that are already in in vogue look at this it's like i'm reading a book about color but there's so many um different reds that are in vogue that it's kind of hard to capture this particular red especially when Red means so many different things to so many different cultures. Mm. So it's um, one of those ones where he can push a red and he can stick to it and he can make it thematic with Gucci. But for there to be a Gucci red, like there already is, but for there to be like this being his signature would be quite yeah, I mean, the, Gu the Gucci red is the, is the red in the gross yeah. grain, no? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah. like... Um, the red between the two green so it's like hmm and obviously like he blew it up and just kept the red because uh, like if you saw this with like um let's say this jacket i mean it's huge like if lapels. you look at the the gucci campaigns um yeah. they focus on that color a lot too yeah let me just yeah because i was i was literally about to say because i was like there are there are ways to do it that make it look Gucci, but then there is this way that he's doing it that makes it look like I can mm. possibly get this jacket from somewhere else. Because mm. there is like um like what makes this jacket Gucci? Like what makes it recognizable as a Gucci jacket? And I'm not I talking guess about my I'm one my of what I would say is that what makes it Gucci, at least now, is that this is the minimalistic uh, tailoring that Sabato is pushing with his vision of Gucci. So that's what makes it Gucci. I think that maybe six or more seasons from now, we'll actually associate that look as a very Gucci look, especially with the colour, if they go with the colour um, mm. further. Yeah, like so, like like um, like you're saying, we'd have to be quite far removed for um mm. from this color being in vogue to it not being in vogue, and people still wearing it because they want to wear a red jacket that looks like Gucci. Because 
there's a lot of people now are buying and wearing and selling vintage leather jackets mm -hmm. and everybody wants a leather jacket right now but can you sell this particular item when it's not in vogue mm. because the way that people are wearing those the potato green when it's like oh wait this is this green is quite because like once you wear that particular green it's a statement <laughs> but this one is kind of like you know it's kind of out the way like it's not it's not necessarily saying it's like so showy but you know like for real if you're wearing a red jacket you're probably going to be one of the only people wearing uh, this particular type of red in like your local area so mm. it's like it's quite interesting unless you're like in a super duper metropolitan area but yeah no like um him pushing this like i would like to see it like you're saying six seasons from now yeah, it'll be I interesting, just kind of like, I brought it up as like a case study just to see like if this is something that sticks mm. um, over the course of like many more seasons and then it becomes something that we just naturally associate with Gucci the same way that when Alessandro was at Gucci, we those pussy bow blouses were just like, oh, that looks really Gucci. Anytime you see mm. someone wearing that kind of aesthetic. And even if it wasn't by Gucci, we would still say it's a Gucci look because a lot of like Alessandro stuff you could get in a thrift store and kind of style it. Um, but it would be like, oh yeah, that's like a Gucci look kind of thing. So it'll be very interesting to to know that. But yeah, I think all in all, I really like this collection. I love that there was a clear focus on craft. I mean, I'm the person that's the ultimate skeptic on fashion brands, um, prices going astronomically up at scary numbers at the same time the quality going down so to see a designer who came in with a clear focus on craftsmanship i i commend that highly um and yeah i was just a really big fan of this collection i really really enjoyed um watching it going through it looking at the looks looking at kind of his thought process when he was making it um yeah i really enjoyed it Oh, yeah, so my overall thoughts is, like, this was, it was a good collection. It was good. Um, I don't think it would be the best collection. I'm still not sold on it being the best direction for Gucci. But, mm. you know, who am I? Like, what is my opinion for real, for real? Like, he's literally been working for 20 years. But that doesn't mean... That someone I get what you're saying. You, great you, creative director. That's yeah, you had a good point because especially when you're saying in the context of caring, it's kind of like if you have two brands fighting for the same market share, there is an issue that could arise there. Um, that's a very strong point. I think actually to end something that I thought was um, you know, those like sparkly bedazzled looks, they for some weird reason reminded me of Adi Sliman. Because Ali Saman used to have like rock and roll kind oh, of yeah, yeah, clothes yeah, yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. that kind of look like. The only, I'd say the big difference is that because Sabato's um, silhouette is a bit more loose fitting and like wider, which is kind of where tailoring is going in general. If you look yeah. at like Alessandro Sartori, he talks about this all the time with Xenia and like how tailoring in general for menswear is becoming more relaxed. So you can kind of see this with the silhouette of this vest. If Hadi Simon did it, it would be so tight and so skinny that if you're not a stick, you wouldn't be able to fit in it. Mm. I'd say that's like the big difference in terms of how Hadi Simon would do the same thing. But they kind of, it just reminded me of the kind of thing he yeah. would make. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so to round off, it's like, um, I'm not sold on this being the best direction for Gucci. But at the same time, I do actually like him and i like his brazenness as well because you know mm. when i was talking the other uh, the other year wow it's actually a, a couple of years ago i've been talking about how um Karen, uh, creative directors don't talk as much and you know i liked seeing him talk so you know i'm endeared to the fact that he's in the spotlight and he's going to do something about it so yeah like um i like him i do want him to succeed but at the same time if this isn't the direction for Gucci, will he switch up? That's, that's my last yeah. question. So, yeah.
This YouTube channel runs on your support. If you want to support the channel, you can subscribe to my Patreon. You'll gain access to exclusive content that includes everything from my Patreon podcast, where I give a behind the scenes insight into the fashion industry, as well as a fashion book club, where I review my favorite fashion books. You can also check out my fashion ebook, which highlights the best fashion journalists to follow, definitions of common fashion terminology, and how to determine what a good source of fashion information is. The links to everything are in the description below.